The opening words from Evolution Wonder Lounge. Pride is almost upon us. And that means pride for everyone. If you're ripped or round, smooth or hairy, mask or femme or butch, ace or pen or trans, younger or older, closeted or out, able-bodied or not, straight and supportive, whatever your religion, your race, your gender, you're part of our pride. We light this flame to ignite our hearts and minds, the spark of knowledge that enlightens, the shimmering hope that burns, the blazing love that engulfs our actions, the bonfire of our commitment. We light this flame for those who celebrate themselves, who fear, who hope, who persevere, who are on the side of love for all. We light this flame for those who have been ridiculed that they may find peace. For those who have fought to marry that they may celebrate. For those who live in uncertainty in the world that they may have hope. We light this flame to renew our commitment that no one shall ever again suffer for the right to love. We light this flame to celebrate our kaleidoscope of diversity, working, loving, and living on the side of love. For this, we light this flame. I'd like to invite Violet Slevin forward to share a reading with us this morning. People ask me sometimes, is this a gay church? It is a privilege to answer. Ours is absolutely, gladly, hopefully and humbly, gaily, a gay church, a gay tradition where everyone, including heterosexual members and friends, is welcome, where everyone is needed, where everyone's experience is cherished as a sacred text because no one's experience of living or loving can be comprehensive because each of us holds clues the others need to know about how to live with dignity and joy as a human person. And none of us knows enough about that yet to be considered whole. It is absolutely a gay church, even as ours is a gay world. If you would look around, gay church, straight church, people's church, a human congregation made holy by holy hopes and fears and dreams of all who wish to come. Come in, we say. Come out. (laughs) Come in. We're all in this together. I will speak not of tolerance with its courteous clenched teeth and bitter resignation, I will speak not about acceptance or other people and some other kind of lifestyle. I can only look in laughing wonder at human life in all of its incarnations. I can taste only in passing the breath of the spirit of life on my mouth and understand our common longing to breathe in deep, deep gulps of it. I cannot think of being anyone else's ally even, because even that implies some degree of separation. Some degree of safety for some of us, not all. We are allied with no one and with nothing but love, the larger love, transcending all of our understanding, which within all of us is different, differing, gorgeously various, variant, beautifully deviant aspects of ourselves that are bound in elegant unity. I know that on some sad and disappointing days these words describe the church that yet shall be and not the church that is. I know, I know, but I know too that to answer an act of creation, to answer this question and some others is a privilege, a prosaic imperative, a joy, a duty, and a holy sacrament. Thank you, Violet. Appreciate it. John Marsh was the minister of this congregation during the 1990s mostly. He served for nine years. And in the course of that time, uh, he was working with an intern, and they assembled a book of history of Western congregations, history, small histories of Western congregations, and he wrote our chapter. And he wrote this section on our history with gay rights. Reverend Rob Brownlee performed the first same-sex ceremony of union in our church in 1973. 
By the end of 1984, when he departed, he had performed more than 30. In April 1978, Anita Bryant came to Edmonton to promote her anti-gay views. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton joined with a citywide coalition to protest Bryant's message of hatred. And Rob Brownlee maintained a high profile during that campaign, one of the few public leaders who did. And shortly afterwards, CBC invited him to appear on Leo LeClaire's television show. And even against tremendous anti-gay bias on the panel, Brownlee's rational human rights perspective dominated the debate. And CBC aired the show six more times during the next few years. The personal story of church member Stan Calder illustrates the importance of the church's works in human rights. Shortly after I joined the church formally, my friend and I became estranged. And some months after, a letter was sent to all members of the staff at the high school where I was teaching adults, to the school board and to the Alberta's Teachers Association. The letter alleged that I was using my position as a teacher to make sexual contacts with my male students. I was devastated. That night I left my apartment and spent the night driving around town, my mind alternating between taking my own life and fighting back. About five in the morning I came to Rob's apartment. I felt it was the only place that I could go. Yet I didn't really know whether he would turn me out or not. Rob saved my life that night. I was asked to return to the classroom the next day and nothing further happened. When the Unitarian Universalist Association published The Welcoming Congregation, a curriculum about the ways to make churches more welcoming to groups that suffer chronic discrimination, Stan Calder led those workshops uh, here and in other congregations in Western Canada. And to the date of John's writing in 1994, the Unitarian Church of Edmonton was the first and only church in Canada to have met the criteria established by the Continental Association and the first to be designated a welcoming congregation. I'm happy to report that as of today, all of Canadian congregations are designated welcoming. In 1994, the congregation hosted the annual Interweave Convocation, the Unitarian Universalist Conference to discuss issues concerning gay, lesbian, and bisexual people. And the opening ceremony was held at City Hall, and the keynote speaker was Sven Robinson, a member of Parliament from British Columbia. We came a long way between 1973 and 94. In the reading that Violet shared, Virginia Safford closed her reading with this lovely sentiment. I know that on some sad and disappointing days, these words describe the church that yet shall be, and not the church that is. I know. I know. But I know, too, that to answer is an act of creation. To answer this question and some others is a privilege a prophetic imperative, a joy, a duty, and a holy sacrament. That's really a reward and a challenge of being part of a community that calls itself a church. I'm often asked how this church, this liberal church, this creedless church of ours, dis uh, differs, I should say, from a social club of some sort. As a member of the Rotary Club, sometimes when I'm there, I wonder, no, I... There are many answers, but one of them might be that we gather around a set of ideals, a set of what we might be, rather than a statement about what we are. We know that as much as we might love or like or appreciate this place and the people who are in it, the best this will ever be is a work in progress. Sure, we can celebrate our successes and enjoy them thoroughly, and we should. But we are aware that when it comes to human rights and dignity, there is always and will always be more work to do. Heck, even with the giant strides in the 23rd century and the near-perfect universe of Star Trek, 
there's still conflict and battles and growth to be painfully managed. Pride Week in Edmonton and across the world is a good example. Yeah, there are parties that are raucous and fun. There is a magnificent and joyful pride parade that many of you will participate in next week. But there are also seminars, educational opportunities, and interfaith prayer services. Enjoy how far we've come. Celebrate the community and the freedoms that have been won, but never mistake this for a final resting place. The trite idea of the journey being more important to the destination captures the point. We need only to look back in time and not very far back in time to struggle successfully accomplished to know that there will always be more to do. LGBTQ2 rights are just one more case in point. 21 years ago, not long after uh, that reading ended, we were honored by the Edmonton Pride community for our support of Delwyn Vreend. For those of you who don't know the case, Delwyn Vreend was fired from a Christian college in 1991 because he was open about his sexual orientation. The case went all the way to the Supreme Courts of Alberta and Canada and became a landmark human rights ruling. This church and our then minister John Marsh were with him every step of the way and we got to host the celebration party when the ruling came down. It was especially important since we were a faith community standing up for same-sex rights. That fight was a point of, well a point of pride for us. And the award was well-deserved. It hangs in our library. And it was very much appreciated. For there have been times when that beautiful vision of a very inclusive church seemed very far away. And change was not easy. Earlier I read John's account of the development of gay rights here in the congregation and about how Rob Brownlee began doing union services in 73 and how Stan Calder said his life was saved by this church. I told some of his story not long ago. And John was writing a necessarily condensed article for this book on Canadian congregational histories. So he didn't speak too much about how we got there and the resistance. Back in the early 1970s, everyone was not on side. It is the nature of social change that someone floats an apparently radical idea for something and it seems frightening and scary and usually there is broad resistance and the very first time it's spoken, the idea falls flat. No surprise. A lot of us fear change and upsetting the status quo. I do. So, at first there is no progress at all. But but the idea doesn't go away because it's been spoken out loud. And so, people start ticking it over in the backs of their brains. People in the moderate middle begin to get used to the idea. And the next time it's voiced, it doesn't seem quite so scary and the resistance isn't quite as strong. Maybe we examine old assumptions in the meantime, assumptions that we inherited from generations before, assumptions that we've never really stopped to consider in our lives. Perhaps we listen to some ideas that might move us off our position a little bit. And the more conservative voices grow older and die. I'm sorry, but that is the truth. (laughs) So the idea comes up again, and the resistance is a little bit less. And then voices in favor, which were once completely silent for fear of marginalization or attack, they begin to be heard. And we start to hear about someone we know who has a daughter or a cousin who's gay. They were afraid to speak up before. It was a hostile climate. Or maybe it's someone like a Stan Calder, someone who is already appreciated in the community, and he stands up and says, "Um, I'm gay. And people in this church saved my life. And the issue develops a human face, 
And it becomes about compassion. Just like those tiny lights we were lighting. About finding out each other's story and it becoming not just some abstract idea, but real people we are touching. So it becomes part of the discussion. And that's one way that social change comes about. And if you think of almost any social issue you can name and apply that theory of social change to it, you'll see it works almost every time, at least as part of the process. Well, Rob Ranley had a bit of a lead on the rest of the congregation. His son was gay, and Rob loved him and respected him. And those who remember him know that Mr. Brownlee was not exactly a shy and retiring flower. When it was something important, he stood for what he believed and didn't worry a whole heck of a lot about the consequences. So when Rob stood up and performed very quietly those first same-sex union services, it was not welcomed by all. A lot of us are old enough to remember that the climate of the late 60s and early 70s was becoming much more open sexually, but in fact, that was heterosexual free love. Homosexuality was still very much in the closet and not accepted. Consider this. I found this this week. I didn't, even I didn't know this one, and I know everything. In 1967, the Unitarian Universalist Committee on Goals in the Continental UU Movement, so that's Canada and the States, published the results of a survey on beliefs and attitudes within the denomination. 7.7% of UUs believed that homosexuality should be discouraged by law. 80% that it should be discouraged by education, not law. Only 12% that it should not be discouraged by law or education, and only 1% that it should be encouraged. So in 1967, only 13% of Unitarians and Universalists supported same-sex rights. In 1969, in September, the Reverend James Stahl, who was a Unitarian, became the first minister in North America to publicly declare himself to be a homosexual at the Student Religious Liberals Conference. It would be 10 more years, 1979, before an openly gay minister was ordained into our ministry, and at least four more years before that newly ordained gay minister was able to find work in a parish. In 1983, the first openly gay minister was ordained and settled in Canada, and he also happened to be a Unitarian. That was Mark DeWolf, a one-time housemate of mine. He was called to our congregation in Mississauga, Ontario, and in fact, it was at Mark's ordination that I heard my own call to the ministry. My point is that this cultural change around sexual orientation and identity is not ancient history. Many in this room have lived it. The first Edmonton Pride Parade was held in 1980. And the famous story is that a handful of very nervous people held up signs, hurried two blocks down the road on Jasper Avenue, and dispersed before there could be a reaction. <laughs> we laugh, but how brave were they? Rick Dagg, a longtime member of the LGBT community, commented a few years ago, when I first came out in the very early 80s, it was really not safe to be open. Open discrimination was certainly safe, if not actively encouraged. Now we have legal protection. There is a greater sense of pride within our community. I suspect that in 1980, pride meant let's be brave rather than let's be proud of who we are. Pride was just a dream in a culture of shame. It was somewhere over the rainbow. Can you imagine what it must have been like to live your whole life and your whole truth in the shadows? feeling hated and in danger just because of who you knew you were. Because of the courage of those early pride folk, young people, though still at some risk, know that fear far, far less. 
And pride means something different today. Something positive and something beautiful. In this climate of distrust and what have you of that 1967 survey, this church debated and they decided to step up. Perhaps because Rob Brownlee put a human face on the issue. Some of our members, mostly heterosexual, organized monthly potluck dinners and dances for LGBTQ folks because they had almost no safe places to meet back then, except maybe bars that were subject to raids. It was an act of compassion and an act of justice. Not everyone approved, but at least they tolerated that use of our church building. For the last 30 years or so, we've rented our space to a group of prime timers. It was a support and social group of gay men who were largely still in the, com- in the closet back in 1980. And one of the riders on their rental contract was that we would not allow any other activities in the church when they were meeting once a month in order to protect their privacy. The remaining guys who come in are old men now, and mostly they come in for games nights. They've long since lifted that restriction. And a bench in our garden was a thank you for our longtime support. Not long after those potluck dances started, some members of the congregation, gay and straight, formed a group called Vision. It was meant to make sure that the issue of gay rights stayed in front of the congregation if necessary, that we would challenge our own latent homophobia when it came up. They helped us become the first congregation to go through that welcoming congregation process. But around 1998 or 99, not long after I arrived, the Vision team met with me and said, We think it's time to disband. I said, why? Well, there were LGBTQ members on the board, on all major church committees, and in the church school. They didn't really think they had any more battles to fight at home. And since that time, we've kept growing in positive ways. A decade after we were given that award for supporting Delwyn Vreen, a trans woman joined our church. She dressed very, very well. She classed the joint up. (laughs) Her presence here, however, made some people uncomfortable. It challenged us again. But mostly, she was warmly embraced and made to feel at home. For several years, she served on our board, and she was the founder of our Monster Garage Sale, a legacy that still generates a lot of money for our congregation each year. And thanks to her example, and this is the really important part, thanks to Evelyn's example, we found it easy to warmly support two of our own youth who decided last in the last couple of years to come out as trans people. And they are completely accepted in our community, especially by their fellow youth. So more recently, we were among the vocal supporters and defenders of the Gay Straight Alliance clubs and schools, and some of our kids participate in those clubs. We continue to have a large presence in pride events, as we have had for many, many years, including the parade, and we usually participate in the interfaith worship service as well. And for the last few years, we have been co-hosts of the Dragging Youth series, drag shows that help queer or curious young people explore that world in a very safe place. Even some of our kids have performed in their shows, as well, apparently, as your minister. (laughs) Are we a gay church? It's really kind of a silly question. We try to be a truly inclusive church. We don't always succeed, but we try. And if that is to mean everybody, then it has to mean everybody. Everybody. We may have to work on our inclusivity in some areas, but we all all in all, we've done pretty well when it comes to the LGBTQ2 world. We've come a long way. And next week at the Pride Parade, we get to celebrate our longtime support for gender and orientation rights. But it's just as important to be mindful of where we came from. The struggle for rights, 
the struggle for all the lofty goals laid out in our seven principles will go on. will never really end. But there are times to stop and celebrate. Next week is one of those. And then we get back to work. Amen. Spirit of life, if you have a lesson for us, it is that all life is beautiful. We are each born into this world who we are, tall or short, with our own color of skin, with our own sexual orientation. How can anyone ever tell us that we are anything less than beautiful, anything less than whole? We pray that this nation and every nation will remember their duty to protect human life and particularly the lives of LGBTQ persons fleeing danger and death. We pray that those who are forced from their homelands and their cultures and their religions, not because of some fault or sin, but because of who they are, are who are placed in grave danger simply for being the person they were born to be. We pray also for the enlightening of governments here and around the world who, with casual disregard for life, would deport those refugees back to their unfeeling homelands and near certain death. All human beings are born free, equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience. May we all act towards one another in affirmation of our common humanity.